My slides is like the last chapter, the multiple testing, which is a very short summary of uh, the whole chapter. So it's a, a lot like theoretical, less counting. So I'm just going to focus more on the concept. So for multiple testing, this is the one that I did in March and I have not edited it since then. <laughs> oh no, this is the one I did in May. So let's talk about the basics, the introductions to what is a hypothesis testing. So in our view, we usually think of like the now hypothesis, it means like everything is the same. So for example, like the expected blood pressure for the mice in the control and the treatment group, one with the steroid or one without the steroids are usually the same. Then when we have a multiple hypothesis testing means you have a number of now hypotheses. Okay. Then the hypothesis test usually allows us to answer yes, is there a yes and no question such as is there really a difference between the groups or there's no difference between the groups. For example, is there a difference between group A and group B and there's no difference. The alternative one will be there's a difference between group A and B. So we actually have four steps when it comes to hypothesis testing. So the first one is you have to define first come out with what is a now and what is an alternative hypothesis. Then from there, usually we've constructed appropriate uh, statistics for it. Then you start to compute the p-value and final, the last step is you making a decision whether you do want to reject or not reject the now hypothesis. So, so these decisions uh, at the level for the steps for is usually based on the p-value. Like in our scientific field, we usually depends on the p-value set to a threshold, like maybe 95% confidence interval. So the p-value usually is anything less than 0 0.05. Then that will be like, we will call it significance. Then we will say we reject the null hypothesis. So step one, when you have to define the null and the alternative one, so the now hypothesis is more like what you really believe as the default state for the, your belief about the world. For example, we know that let's say the now, let's say in the linear regressions where we have to plot uh, X regression, X then onto the Y using X to predict the Y, we will say the coefficients of the beta usually equals to zero for now. Or, in a more layman terms, it's like, let's say you have two groups. One is a control and treatment groups. Then we will say the now is there's no difference in like, let's say blood pressures between the control and treatment group. The alternative is something that we want to expect different, which is not the default and is something that unexpected. So usually let's say in the experiments, like something that you have done differently and you expect to have some changes on the default state. So we will say the alternative is based on coefficients. The co we will say the beta usually is like not equal to zero. And maybe let's say there's a difference between the control and the treatment group. But um, one thing that I really find interesting is this one. I think they try to emphasize the treatment of like how we actually treat now and how we actually understand alternative hypotheses is actually we understand them as if they are symmetrical, means they are equivalent. If it's not now, then it must be alternative. But they say what the book is trying to emphasize is the treatment for our now and alternative is actually asymmetrical, okay? So we always treat, because we always treat now as the default state of the work. So we, and we focus, our focus and emphasis is more on we want to use our data to reject the now. So when we reject the now, and this always provides us evidence in favor of the alternative, right? So when we re manage to reject the now, we can say, oh, we are making a new discovery. So then we say, oh, now is actually not true. But if you do it in the reverse thinking, so let's say what happens when you fail to reject the now. There are two outcomes. Okay, you do not know whether you fail to reject the now, let's say because of your sample size is too small, 
maybe you, you don't have enough of a sample to really get the appropriate p-value. That's why your sample size is too small. You fail to reject. Or really, there's, you fail to reject the null because there's really no differences. Means the null is really the true state, true default one. So this is what they mean by the treatment of the null and the alternative hypothesis is asymmetrical. And then step two, go back to step two, like the test statistics. So because let's say if you are comparing two groups, we usually use the T statistics. Okay, so the T test, usually where you want to summarize, so all these statistics is just a way of calculating whether you are able to get a value that are consistent with the null hypothesis or not. Then they have this, they say, now let's say you have the mean as the same, right? The treatment and the control group should be the same if it's a null. Then when you have an alternative one, your treatment and your control means are usually not the same. So this is the formula for to calculate t-statistics where the top one, the numerator, is the difference in the mean between the two groups divided by the standard deviation. Okay. Then next one is consider p-value. So p-value is, then you have to take into consideration is what they say is how much t. So once you have calculated this t, okay, there are different values of t. But how do you want to know this t-value? is considered large enough for you to e reject the assumptions of null hypothesis. So how do you want to make a decision? What is the threshold? How much of the T for us to reject that uh, null hypothesis? So means how much statistics is considered large enough. So the, as you, T and P value are related as in the larger the T, the smaller the P value will be. So p-value is the correct definition should be the probability of getting a test statistics at least as extreme as the observed statistics, but under the assumptions that your now has to hold, means your now has to be true. So p-value converts uh, our test statistics into a numbers between zero to one, which makes it easier for interpretations, okay? Then a very small p-value means you have more evidence to reject the null, means you can reject the null with higher confidence. So usually if given that t is 2.33, usually for p less than 0 0.05, is the t has to be somewhere by 1.96. So let's say you have a t, 2.33, so we are calculating what is the probability of you having observed such a large value of t given that the assumptions that your null hypothesis is true. You can see here t at 2.33 is somewhere around here between slightly more than 2. Then you can see to the right of the vertical line is about 1% of the area falls to the right of the vertical line. So we can say, okay, if there's only 1% of the area of the curve force on the right side, then we say there's only a 2% chance of observing a value that greater than 2.33 or even less than negative 2.33. Okay, so after the calculation, the, when you have 2.33, your p-value is about 0 0.05. That's why I say when is P is 0 0.05, it's about 1.96. So means that a P value of 0 0.02 means that if assuming your now is true, you will only see such a T value, such a large T value, 2% of the time. Okay, 0 0.22 means only about 2% of the time, which is very extreme. So you can say with higher confidence that actually the alternative hypothesis seems more probable. Then the final one is making decisions whether to reject the null. 
So the p-value, there's actually no like agreed threshold of whether you want to set it to 0 0.05, anything less than 0 0.05, then we reject that. There's actually no threshold. So it really depends on the field that you're working on. Then some field requires you to have a more extreme p-value such as 0 0.01, which is making the decisions to reject the now the hypothesis even more difficult. Because then you have to take it, there's a, there's a give and take situations when, when, when we are making the decision whether do you want to reject the now or do you do not want to reject the now. So because a small p-values give you an evidence against the now, right? So when your p-value is sufficiently small, you will want to reject the now. But in certain fields, sometimes you won't get the findings exactly very small p-value. So you can't say with high degree of confidence that I will manage to reject the now. Let's say it's a bit on the ambiguous sites where you have like the threshold is set at 0 0.05, then you get something like 0 0.5. 0.51 or maybe slightly like 0 0.049. So that's only a difference of 0 0.01 difference from the threshold. So to undo that, you have to understand the give and take situation is that there are two types of errors, the type one error and the type two error. So type one error refers to the false positive error and type two error refers to the false negative um, error. So there will be four scenarios whenever you make these decisions to reject the null hypothesis. So provided the reality is the one on the panel on the left here, right? So, oh, no, sorry. The reality is the one on the top here. So provided that the reality, the null hypothesis is true. So the reality that's really true, the null is the true answer then you, you can either make two types of decisions, whether you don't reject or you reject. So provided that your now is really true and you don't reject, so you're making a correct in, um, decision. Okay, so this is the correct decision. But provided that your now is true and yet you rejected that, so you're making the type 1 error, which is the false positive error and we call this probability equals to alpha. So this is the alpha, is the p-value is the one that threshold that we set usually 0 0.05. So usually we set this alpha as 0 0.05. Then given that your now is false, right? You can make either then you reject that. So you're making a correct decision or you is false and yet you fail to reject that. So you're making a type two error, which is a false negative error. And we call this probability of beta. So this beta, and when you have one minus beta, this one is usually the power of the study. So provided that your now is false and you manage to reject that, this is usually the power. And usually for other study, you want to set it as high power, about 90% power. Uh, okay, so I talk about the power, right? So the power is the probability of not making type two error, given that your alternative hypothesis holds. Means the probability of correctly, correctly rejecting the now, okay? Which is here, this part. Given that the now is false, then you fail to manage to reject that. This one minus beta, this is your power of the study. Okay, power and alpha, which is this one, this power and alpha is actually related. So sometimes you have to make the decision as in when you set the alpha to be very low instead of the standard like 0 0.05 you set it to 0 0.01 so this make the decision to reject the now even harder right so you are in actually increases the type or the chances of you uh, making type 2 error 
So means you sometimes will not manage to reject it even that the null hypothesis is false. Okay, so we talk about multiple testing. A lot of the tests that actually in real world or in like academic world, the thing is that when we do testing, we don't do a single testing. We actually run multiple studies, multiple analysis at the same time. So we will have a multiple now hypothesis. So if we have multiple now hypothesis and they are collected based on the same data set, but we are just rerunning the analysis again and again, is it possible? Can we just reject all the null hypotheses based on one single threshold? So the answer is no, definitely we cannot do that because by doing so, we are rejecting them based on as if they are like a single testing. We are increasing the chances of making type one error. And to remind you, type one error is just the probability of making, uh, means incorrectly reject the now, even though it's true, okay? So this is the analogy of why at each time you do multiple testing, you actually increases the chance of making type one error. So let's say we have 1,000 and, uh, we have coins, right? Coins has two sides, either head or tail. And let's say uh, we flip the coins about 10 times. So we will expect that uh, there are some chances that sometimes it will come out head, sometimes it will come out tail. So, but then what are the chances that all the coins will come out all tails? So it's over like two to the power of 10, you will get about um, 1,024 scenarios. So if you flip, you have like 1,024 coins. We expect um, on average one coin to come out to get all tiers on average. So this one is you are flipping 10 coins and 10 times, I think, right? Wait, huh? So wait, I don't understand this analogy. Uh, we flip 1,000, okay? Yeah, I, no, I think this is written wrongly. So we flip the coins 10 times. So you have about 10 coins. Then each will get two sides. That's why you got 1,024. So the 1,000 can show us like the number of possibilities? Mm, this is to be the number of possibilities because this is 2 to the power of 10 is 1,024. Because you flip it 10 times, but then means I want all the single, like all 10 times the possibility, like what is the possibility that you can get all 10? to be tail. So the probability is that you want all to come up with the tail, then they say if the coins is actually fair, the probability of you getting or observing at least 10 tails is one over two to the power of 10, which is one over 1024. And this probability is really low because in order like you flip 10 times and you want to get all 10 times to be tail, the possibility is really really low okay it's the same the reverse direction is if what is the 10 you flip 10 times what is the cross probability of out of these 10 times you get 10 hits is about 0 0.01 as well so if you add out these two probability will be in 0 0.02, okay? Then we will conclude, okay, since is the probability of getting all hits and getting all tears is very low, then it is, it is a not fair decision. It is not a fair coin, even though the probability is very low. So what is actually they're trying to use to emphasize from these analogies? If you do a multiple testing, 
it is almost at every single chance that you can get a very small p-value by chance. You might not get it, but also by chance, you might get a very small p-value. If you do multiple testings, you keep on testing a hypothesis. Okay. So then if we make our final decisions based on how a large number of testing that we have done, we will end up rejecting a great amount of, we say, a true now hypothesis, which is you're making a very, you're increasing your chance of making type 1 error, which is the false positive error. Then they say there's a way to appro uh, 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 approximately calculate the probability of type 1 error, which is, let's say, you set your p-value to very low, 0 0.01. And let's say you do M now hypothesis. If you do 10 times, your probability increased by 0 0.01 times 10. That's all. So if your p-value, you, the threshold you set at 0 0.01, and you do 10,000 testing, right? So you will get about 100. One, two, three, 100. So you'll be you will falsely reject out of these 10,000 times, you will falsely reject, make the wrong decision about 100 times by chance. So that means we can't really use the alpha or the threshold. So what they are trying to say is when you do a multiple testing, what you want to do is you counter for the family-wise error rate. Means you calculate the probability of at least making the type one error when you conduct multiple hypotheses. Okay, so they, they have this alphabet, it's really difficult to remember, but you can think of it like uh, when now is true, you do not reject that now. So this U is the correct one. But when now is true and yet you reject this V, so V stands for false positive. Okay, and when now is false and you do not reject that W, this W is your false negative. Okay, so in reality, we do not know the value of this V, U, S, or W. It means we do not know whether we are even making the right decision or we are making the wrong decision. We can only base our decision on based on the probability, like how confident we are to reject the now and not to reject the now, right? But we have what they say is since we have the access to VS, means when you, regardless of whether the now is true or the now is false, we have the, we know how much times that we do reject the now, okay? Then we also know regardless of whether the now is true or false, we know how many times that we do not reject the now or do not reject the now. So these are the numbers that we know when the now hypothesis are rejected or not rejected. And based on this, we can calculate our uh, family-wise error rate. So we can take of it like family-wise error rate is calculated as one minus probability of V equals to zero means probability of you do not falsely reject any now hypothesis. Then we assume that we have um, all the M tests means all the multiple testings that you do, they are independent from one another. Then we assume all now hypotheses will be true. Okay, so if you look at this one, we have three lines, the orange, blue, and the maroon color line. So you will see the alpha value when you set the alpha value, the P threshold, to be very, very small, 0 0.001. You actually, it means that it's really, really difficult to reject the now. And compared to the orange line where it's 0 0.05, which is the normal threshold, so you see, once you pass a certain level, let's say you have one hypothesis, yeah, your p-value, your alpha will still be 0 0.05. But as the number of hypotheses means the more statistics or 
more testing that you're doing means you're running the analysis more often. As the number of hypotheses increases, you will see that family-wise error rate is increasing. And you will see for 0 0.05 by about 40, almost approaching, um, approaching 50, the family-wise error rate is almost one. So means it's like 100% family-wise error rate. Okay, so you will always reject the null when you have like more than this testing. So, um, with Z, let's say, but for the blue line, if you set the alpha to 0 0.01, you still is increasing at the lower gradient, like smaller gradient, but it's still that you will see, this is the threshold 0 0.05, so you can see not more than about, I would say about five, it's about four. Once you pass four, you actually pass your alpha value, the family-wise error rate is actually more than 0 0.05. Okay, so what they say is like to calculate family-wise error rate, to account for the type one error, you want to consider this formula, which is one minus, one minus alpha. Alpha is the threshold that you set, this one. And the M is how many tests that you have. Okay, so to control for family-wise error rate, three common methods. I'm okay with the first two, but I, I will be, I think I'm a bit confused about the last method. So I'll, let me know if it's like confusing when explaining the last method. So for the first method, von Voroni, that's the easiest one. To counter for multiple testing, let's say you set your alpha to be 0 0.05, okay? For von Voroni is as you divide the 0 0.05 with the number of testing that you have. So if let's say you have five tests, right? Then, we take the 0 0.05 divided by 5 means the new threshold now is 0 0.01. So based on that new threshold, 0 0.01, I can reject 1, which is, there's a difference for manager 1, the mean. Okay, but then I fail to reject 2, 3, 4, and 5. So this one, this is the results that they have from this something, a data set called the fun data set which is the data set has all the means and the standard deviations of the returns of what that the managers managed to earn. It means it was a, it's an investment company. So how much the manager, like what's the percentage or the mean return for each manager. So when you have higher return, definitely you are a better manager. And what we can see out of these five, because it means we have five testing, uh, five multiple testing. So if the alpha is set at 0 0.05 for bond pharaoh method, you set at 0 0.05, you've got five testing, 0 0.05, you divide by number of testing, you will get the new threshold, then which is 0 0.01. Then you can reject only the manager one. Okay, but if you don't do this bond Ferroni correction, if you base it on 0 0.05, if you base it on 0 0.05, you realize that we can reject manager one and manager three because they are both less than 0 0.05. Okay, but we test our testing, we are testing actually five hypotheses. So our family wise error rates theoretically is greater than 0 0.05. Okay, so to counter for that family-wise error rate, we do a bond pair correction, which is then we only reject the now only for the first manager. The problem is with bond Ferroni method is because it is very stringent. So it's very conservative. It makes it very difficult to reject the now hypothesis. 
this is only five, but imagine you have 100, then it's almost impossible to reject the noun all the time. So they have come up with an alternative method, which is the Holmes Bond Ferroni method. Holmes method still control for family wise error rate, but it is less conservative, as in means there's a higher possibility that you can reject more now hypothesis. And the good thing is when you can reject more now hypothesis, you're making less type two error. Oh, sorry. There's an update on my system. Okay. So when you have results in less type two errors, means is a good thing as in your power of your study, usually you have greater power. So for Holmes method, it's slightly different. We will still use this same data set from this fun data set. What they're actually doing for um, Holmes method is you are rearranging all the p-value from the smallest p-value to the largest p-value. Okay, so you have to rearrange the p-value from small to large. So you get the smallest one, as you can see, the manager one has the smallest p-value. After that, they actually do a calculation to get a new threshold. So this is a formula they actually get, which is the new p-value is taking the alpha divided by m plus l minus j. What does it mean? It's something like this. So let's say you have... Um, you have this 5p value, you first rearrange. So now manager 1, followed by manager 3, then this manager 4, this is manager 5, and the final is manager 2. Okay. To, then you have to use this formula, which is alpha 0 0.05, okay, divided by m, which is how many tests you have, you have five tests, plus L, the previous, the lower bound, which is one, you take the one, oh, sorry, M plus one minus J, okay, means minus the position. This J, this stands for the position. So once you rearrange this, you put 0 0.05 divided by M, the number of testing, plus one, then minus this is position one. Then you get the value as in 0 0.01. Okay. Then you will compare this new value to the 0 0.06. And 0 0.06 is less than 0 0.01. So you reject the manager. This is 0 0.06 is manager one. Then the next one, you take 0 0.05 by five plus one minus two. This is the second position. So it means that when you do Holmes method, you will have different P alpha threshold for each the test. Okay, because this one in the formula, you take into consideration the position. Then this one, you will get 0 0.0125. And this 0 0.012 is still lesser. So by using this method, earlier the bond Ferroni, we only managed to reject manager one, right? But using Holmes method, you're able to reject manager one and manager three. So you're making more rejections and hence you are actually increasing the power. So this is the illustrations of, like they were doing a simulated data set and what they found is this is interesting by ordering the p-value just by rearranging your p-value from the smallest to the largest, you can see that uh, uh, the black line, just to remind you, is 0 0.05. Okay, and this one, the multiple testing, they tested 10 times. Here you have, means you have 10 dots because they tested 10 times. Okay, and the red one is the actually the false now hypothesis means you do want to reject them, okay? You want to reject them. The black one is you do not want to reject them, so they should be on top. Okay, 
So you have three scenarios. The black line is the normal, uh, what did I say? The normal 0 0.05. The blue one should be the, I think the blue one is the Holmes method. Oh, the blue one is the Holmes method. The black one is the Bonferroni method. So you're comparing these two methods, Bonferroni. You can see Bonferroni managed to reject almost all in the first panel. The second panel then failed to reject one in the first panel. Second panel re rejected all except one because this one is on the line. Okay. Then in the last panel, you only managed to reject three. Okay. But if you see one uh, Holmes method, they only make the wrong decision on the first panel one. Second and the third, they actually managed to reject it. So because Holmes method is like less conservative, it's also more lenient with the rejection and the threshold. So it actually has more power and in the long run, it's actually a better test than the bond for run. So conclusion is, I think we only want a conclusion. They make about the same conclusions, but only Holmes reject on the rate point. So uh, conclusion is Holmes is always better than Von Peroni. Turkey's and Schaeffer method is a bit confusing for me, to be honest. So Turkey's method is a bit, uh, so Turkey is when you want to have a pairwise comparison, let's say, um, after you have computed all the p-value, then you want to make a num a certain comparisons. Let's say you don't want to compare like manager one with the default one. Let's say you know, okay, I want to just compare manager one and manager three because you have looked at the mean and you have looked at the p-value. Okay, I think that's the turkey's method, right? Uh, it, so yeah, the case method is when you want to compare a pairwise comparison. It means you only want to select certain pairs out and you want to compare the differences in means between a number of groups. Sheffer method is more of like, let's say you have like manager one, two, three, four, five. You want to compare group versus group. Maybe you want to group manager one and three together in the same group. Then after that, the two, manager two, four, and five in another group, and you compare these two groups together. So that's the Sheffield methods. So, but anyway, for these two methods is, so they are looking, if you look at this panel, right? So they are actually computing it, whether like how, how efficient is this turkey's method on the simulated data set with six means? And what they realize is if you use the Bonferroni method, which is which line? Uh, Bonferroni is the black line, this one, the lowest one. Turkey's is the blue line. Okay. You realize that Bonferroni is very conservative. That's why almost like you will see in the last panel, you only manage to reject one. They fail to reject quite a number. Okay. So if you ask, Turkey's and Bonferroni actually performing about similarly, but Turkey's method just have slight, slight higher power than Bonferroni. Okay, if you look at this simulator, the, the decision that they make are about the same. For Sheffield method, is um, you have they have this formula where so they in the book they did not say how we calculate the turkeys and the Sheffield method because according to them it's very complicated. So that's why there's no calculation here. But Sheffield methods is you can use, they say it seems that you will have a very certain threshold to control for the family-wise error rate. You will have to set the alpha to a certain threshold. Okay, then you recalculate using their statistics. And what they say is like for Sheffield methods, we are using the same 
once you calculated the new alpha, you're using this same alpha repeatedly to perform any of the pairwise comparisons. The takeaway point is Bon Ferroni and Holmes are actually the procedure that will work in most settings. So usually you will see people stick to Bon Ferroni and Holmes. But if you compare Bon Ferroni and Holmes, Holmes seems to have a higher power and it seems to be a better choice than the Bon Ferroni. However, they say in very, very special case, rarely, turkeys and chefing might be able to give you still a better result. If not, just stick to the Holmes method. Then the final one is when we also, while we're calculating um, accounting for the family-wise error rate, you also do want to take into account of what is the false discovery rate. So false discovery rate is relates to the power of the studies. So the power of the studies is how many false now now hypotheses that we correctly that we rejected divided by how many total number of false now hypotheses. Okay. So. There's a trade-off between family-wise error rate and power. So as you do more multiple testing, your power will decrease. Okay, so this dash that you see, this dash the, uh, dotted line, dash lines, is actually the family-wise error rate. And we usually fix it at 0 0.05. So as you have more, which is the orange is 10, 100, and this maroon is about 500. So you will see the power actually decreases as you have more testing. So this happens a lot, I think, for like those people doing the genetic study because they have to test like, they do multiple testing as if they're testing gene, let's say gene A versus gene B. They're doing many genes com uh, pairwise comparisons. So because they're doing so many testing on the same data set, it's the same human body. So they actually have like, their study has less power and usually that's why they have to set their alpha to be uh, slightly higher. Uh, okay, so what happens is if you do the bond for Roni or the Holmes method, it works up to a certain extent when you only have an appropriate size of now hypothesis. But just now, as I mentioned, like genetic studies, you have to do pairwise comparisons for many genes, right? There's, so there's no way for us, if you, especially if you're using the bond for Roni, you will get a very, because the alpha is divided by the number of uh, now, um, sorry, number of testing that you have. So you will set the new alpha thresholds to be very low, which makes it almost impossible to reject. So this is when the false discovery rate comes into play, right? Um, so false discovery rate, uh, discovery rate is based on the concept that we have to be comfortable to live with a few wrong decisions. So when you have such a very large mock testing, you have to tolerate a few false positive in the interest of making more discoveries or else if you just insist on using the family wise error rate, you just want to make like very, very good decision. In the return, you don't make any decision, make any new discovery at all. So it, that's even worse, means your power of the study is very low. So when your, you have multiple testing, your M is very large, you just need to have a few false positive. So that's why we have this false discovery rate. Okay, so false discovery rate is just when you're trying to reject, let's say you can set it to 20%. So it means I'm comfortable with 20% and there's no a fixed threshold. So it can be any of threshold that you decide. When you set your false discovery rate to about 
So we are just saying we are rejecting as many null hypotheses as possible while guaranteeing that not more than 20% of these rejected are false positive. So it means that the maximum false positive that we can have in the study is about 20%. Then we're assuming like 80% will be the correct. So only 20% will be the false positive. No, the 20% is it like 20% of the M or the error? <laughs> 20% of like think of like 20% is like making the wrong decision, uh the wrong decision. So so if my M is 100, so 20% is I accept. 20 out of 120 of them to be like, false. Ah, uh. uh, yeah, like let's say you have like 100 hypotheses right now. So 20% are accept like the 20 will be the wrong one. <laughs> yeah. So, and this one makes sense a lot. Let's say like 100, we will still consider whether we can use homes. But let's say you have 10,000. So I, so I will say I will comfortable with leaving about like 2,000 about the wrong one which is the wrong discovery. <laughs> so that's why they say, like, let's say, like they say this Q, let's say you set it as 20%, right? So means this trend, you, it won't be like 20%, but it's just saying it's like the maximum, the false this positive will be 20%. It might be lower, but in reality, we don't know whether we are making the correct decision or wrong decision. Oh, we just want to set the threshold of wrong. Oh, I just read it wrong. Yeah, yes, the next slide says the 20% means 20% of the rejected now hypothesis. So the rejected now hypothesis may be quite low as well. And 20% of a low number maybe is not too bad. Yeah. yeah. So this one is just like how much mistakes that you allow yourself to have. Yeah. So the like I, I think of like false discovery as like how much like mistakes that you allow yourself to have. But 20% is actually quite a lenient threshold. So usually people, I think people, what I've seen on papers is people usually set it to about 10%. Like you don't want that the false positive rate to be like more than 10%. So about you still want about. So the reverse of it, we will say if it's like 20%, right, this one, the power of the study will be 80%. So if you set the Q as false discovery rate is about 10%, so you will have said I have 90% power in my study. Okay, so the example, maybe this one will help you understand it better as in, if you want to conduct a hypothesis testing, right? And you have about 20,000 now hypothesis because you want to test on 20 drugs candidate. So the first part is definitely we have a, such a big, of drug candidates. You can't be like use a very stringent criteria to begin with. So we need to have this elimination stage. Okay, you just want to identify from this 20,000. I just want a small subset. Maybe I will just want to get 10 drug candidates out of these 10. Then I compare their performance. So you just want to downsize the number of candidates that you have. So we are still doing multiple testing here. So we set our, uh, we do a fa uh, family-wise error rate. Then we also set the false discovery rate. So we control how many fractions in these smaller sets that are really false rejection. Okay. So um, just to clarify that our 0 0.05 is our alpha, right? Mm, 0 0.05 is alpha. So if they, they're saying that, okay, so now you have like 20,000 drug candidates, right? You just want to downsize. But if you if you this you set your criteria to downsize based on family-wise error rate, right? Means you expect about 1,000 to have a small p-values by chance because it's very low. And it makes it like you always will make like wrong decision all the time because think of it, if you still, need to, if you use the Bonferroni method, 20,000, your alpha is set at 0 0.05. Then you need to 0 0.05 divide 20,000. Then your new threshold will be super low. There's no way for you to get 
and it's almost impossible to reject your null hypothesis if you use family wise uh, error rate as a control. So what they say is like, just if you have such a big uh, null hypothesis, what you really want to control is actually the false discovery rate. So we want to control how many of the fractions in that small that are really like things that when you downsize it, those are really the false rejection. Okay, so the main takeaway is conclusion when your M is too large, controlling for the family-wise error rate is just impossible. Means you will almost 100% don't make any discovery. Okay, so the uh, false discovery will be better as in it will be like context dependent rather than data set dependent. Okay, uh, I don't think this one is like I want to explain it next week because this one is more complicated, the Benjamin Hodgepack procedure. So this is actually the procedure of how, how you actually can calculate and how you know the p-value. I think I'll continue this next week. Then you all can see, then I'll do the lab next week. I only have a few, a smaller section to go. So, so this method is to get the best FDR or what? Yeah, this is the, for the FDR. This Benjamin, uh, Benjamin Hodgepet procedure is BH procedure. So this is to control your force discovery rate at your pre-specific mm. Q level means S like the alpha, uh, like depending on your field, everyone will have a very different Q. Q refers to the uh, FDR. So you can set it as 20%. And if you want it to be more stringent, you can set it as 10. So you have to specify your Q yourself, just like alpha. So I'll talk about this next week, then I'll finish out the resampling approach, which seems to be slightly better than the force discount. Yeah. So, but any question? I did not post the, my slides. I only put it on GitHub. So if you want, you have to either fork it yourself or like clone it mm. to get the... Mm -hmm. Like, it's a yeah. HTML file, right? Uh, maybe you could mm. change it to index. Oh, then, uh, yeah, I wanted to do it this for this, but no time. Yeah, yeah. you can I send can change your it to R index. mark down to index, and then you need to yeah. index of HTML, and then we see whether mm. your GitHub page will work. Because currently, yeah, it says I... that it fails. Yes, because I... Actually, I just uploaded it. I did not do anything much. <laughs> yeah, but I have to change it to index.htm. But the IMD doesn't have to be changed to index.imd. I um, think only the HTML needs to be. You don't have to. You don't have to. But uh, if you want to change your RMD to index.html, you have to type your render function. You can't just click on the meter button. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but I think yeah. I can change yeah. the HTML and see whether it needs to right? Yeah, but definitely yeah. the index has the HTML has to be there for the GitHub page to work. Or alternatively, it's have a dot folder, but inside the dot folder, you still need an index of dot HTML file. Yeah, I didn't do the dot. It's not on the dot. It's uh, I actually I wanted to do it on the main branch. No. Yeah, I'll do that as soon as possible. I just spent out the whole day. That's why I didn't do much. <laughs> All right. Do you guys have questions? If not, next week I'll finish up the rest. Then the lab is like super fast, nothing much. They're just using that P dot adjusting. Then that'll be the end. Next week will be the last, last week for the book club. <laughs> All right. Then I'll see you guys next week if no questions. Bye. Thanks, Nili, for joining. And thanks, Jeremy. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.